Well, and hello to all of you. Greetings, everyone. I'd like to remind you all that you are uh, being asked to stay muted during this time so that we can all hear the presentation most effectively. But we are so delighted to have you. I'm the Reverend Jill Olds, the Director of the Youth Ministry Institute at Yale Divinity School. The YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar entitled Just Breathe, Resilient Strategies for Today's Youth and Youth Workers. I see some familiar faces and names among our group today, so welcome back, those of you who have joined us before. And a special welcome to all of you who are joining our community for the first time. We're so glad you're here. We may be physically distanced from one another, but we know that our God still knits us together, and for that, we are very thankful. For our time today, Dr. Scott and Reverend Yu will speak to us, and there will be a time for breakout groups, after which we will then regather for some final sharing time and for questions. You will remain muted throughout the large group sessions, but we'll be monitoring the chat window. So if you have a question, please feel free to type that in. And actually, we'll give that a shot now, just so everyone can acquaint themselves with this. And I'd like you to answer the question in chat right now while I'm presenting. Uh, where did you hear about this uh, wonderful event? Did you hear about this on social media from a mutual friend through the YMI um, uh, advertising? Where did you hear about this event? So please do feel free to put that in now. And while you're doing that, just want to introduce our office for a quick second. We have a delightful staff, and uh, today we are joined by Megan Lukens, our communications coordinator, and by me, Jill Olds, the uh, director of the Institute. It's a joy to be here. If you're new to us, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a free chance. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for youth. We have training modules for youth leaders. We have discussion forums. We have nearly 800 video clips and lectures given by leading youth ministry experts. We have COVID-19 era resources. We have tips for anti-racism work with your youth. We have links to all kinds of other resources and all of that is available for free. So please do check us out when you get a chance. We also would like to ask you to mark your calendars for our upcoming events. Our theme for this year's lectures is Not Your Mother's Youth Group, Ministry to Youth in 2020 and 2021. And we chose this because while we often talk about living in unprecedented times, I think many of us would say that 2020 has been one for the record books. So in response to these very unique times, we're tasked with doing some unique ministry. And we are here and honored to help you with that. So in addition to today's very timely attention to how we can cultivate resilience, both within ourselves and in our youth, we also have some upcoming fall offerings that will focus on looking into the science of happiness and satisfaction with youth and how to build up student leadership through mission work at outdoor ministries, even in the midst of a pandemic. Our next offering is Wednesday, November 4th at 1 p.m., at which time we'll welcome Dr. Lori Santos, who is a cognitive scientist and a professor of psychology at Yale University. Her Yale happiness class has become the school's most popular course in the school's history. And she's recently tailored her findings to working with youth in particular. So please do consider joining us then Wednesday, November 4th. And a link to that registration can be found on our website. And now it's my great pleasure to focus on today's offering to introduce you all to Dr. Jana Scott and Reverend Sang Hoon Yu. Dr. Jana Scott is the founder and CEO of Baku International Multicultural Center, US, which is an organization that promotes resilience and reconciliation in difficult areas of the country and world. For eight years, she served in President Obama's administration as Deputy Director, Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. In that role, Dr. Scott guided the engagement of faith-based and community groups on issues of resilience integration, emergency preparedness and response, countering violent extremism, religious accommodations in Homeland Security, H1N1 and other issues within Homeland Security. 
Her resilience work has been shared across the U.S. with U.N. representatives and with several representatives of foreign nations, most notably as part of an international effort with nations in Azerbaijan. During her tenure with the Arizona governor's office, Dr. Scott was also privileged to lead faith response, faith community responses to Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Wilma, and Hurricane Rita. And she led a long-term transitional relief, recovery, and resilience integration project called Project Restore, which over the span of 16 months helped over 10,000 individuals and families who had evacuated the Gulf Coast after the 2005 hurricanes. Dr. Scott, welcome. And I'm also pleased to introduce the Reverend Sang Hoon Yu. Reverend Yu is the founder of The Faithful City. He has led ministries and social services at Arizona State University and the Phoenix metropolitan area for over two decades. He launched Arizona Trauma Informed Faith Community, collaborating with the Arizona Adverse Childhood Experiences Consortium. With Arizona ACE's consortium, he contributed to the authorship of training modules for opioid and substance use prevention and creating statewide standardized ACE's trainings of trainer modules. He has been training schools and their districts to build a trauma-informed school system for youth in the Phoenix area, raising resilient servant leaders and forming a safe and healthy living community. Dr. Scott, Reverend Yu, thank you both so much for being here. We're beyond honored to have you. Thank you, Jill. And we are honored to be here. Um, I will share the screen now so that we can start the presentation. Uh, but I would just like to uh, say that I really am very grateful uh, to the Yale Youth Ministry Institute uh, for uh, the work that you are doing. And I actually look forward to uh, maybe even being able to sit in on that session related to happiness. Uh, let me stop share for a moment because for some reason I'm not able to advance the slides. So let me try this again. Okay. Okay, here we are. And I'm going to uh, start out, this will be a three-part session, and uh, we're so grateful for all of you who have joined in. And stay with us for all three parts if you can. Uh, the first part will be uh, some sharing on the theories of resilience, as well as some promising practices and resilient strategies with youth, uh, uh, followed by a mindfulness, purposefulness exercise that will then um, hopefully prepare you for uh, what we hope to be a very uh, vigorous and informative and interactive breakout session where you as youth workers will think about the resilience framework and how you would apply that in situations related to young people today. So let me just start uh, with this first piece, which uh, relates to what are young people today experiencing? If you know a young person who is not experiencing one of these issues, we need to talk with you because you would be the poster person for uh, thriving and positivity in times of crisis. But just look at that list. There's school closures, unemployment, quarantines and masks, the political incivility and civil uh, unrest, uh, televised shootings and murders, disasters, wildfires, floods, and in many families, unfortunately, there is death that young people are seeing right now. I don't know if there has been another time in history than maybe back in 1918, where young people have experienced this level of instability uh, in their daily lives. So there is some research that has uh, come out of UNICEF that talks about the impact of these kinds of conditions on children, the impact of COVID-19 conditions in particular. One of those obviously is an increase in poverty with how many ever millions of people suddenly finding themselves either unemployed or their uh, livelihood, their business is shuttered uh, and um, things like that. And people facing eviction uh, and what have you. So the increase in poverty has been immediate and it has been 
intense for young people. Decreased access to healthcare services. Uh, we're doing more uh, telemedicine, which is a good thing, but to be able to get to a doctor has been a lot more difficult for children and youth. Sadly, researchers have reported an increase in depression. And we've seen that with an increase here in Arizona of more suicide attempts. Our governor spoke about this just last week, uh, which really caught my eye because of the talk we were going to do today. He and the healthcare director being relatively astonished by the number of suicide attempts among children aged 10 to 14. In addition, there's an increase in food insecurity. For those of you who've seen any of the food banks, food lines, it, it really can be very troubling to see how many people coming really in very nice automobiles. So you know this is probably the first time they've ever had to be in a food line. How many people with children are facing food insecurity? And then there's the increased risk to child safety. Researchers have shown, and we've seen this in Arizona uh, through our work with the police department where incidences of domestic violence have increased and their children at home during that. And we know that in incidences of domestic violence, child safety is at a higher risk, whether it's intentional or unintentional. One of the things I didn't mention here was even an increase to um, the stress of being on computers for so much time in a day not being able to get out and play. Now, some of that I know is starting to open up in some states, but what we're beginning to see is as things open up, we're seeing a resurgence of the virus. And in places like Arizona, things have started to be tamped down more, where schools have had to go back to sending more children into a remote learning environment. So this pandemic is not being distributed equally. It's expected by to be most damaging for children in the poorest neighborhoods, no surprise there, and for those in already disadvantaged and vulnerable situations. So think about that as you think about the young people that you serve. I just wanted to share just a couple editorial uh, cartoons that I thought really spoke to these times. The first one in the upper left is death writing what I did on my summer vacation. And we know that the conditions of COVID and even for some, the conditions of civil unrest caused death to happen immediately in family. One day, your brother or your uncle or your dad or grandpa was there. The next day, they were gone. The second cartoon is children going back to school. And they're saying, in person, remote, hybrid, oh my. There's a confusion for some children as to how school is going to be happening. The third one speaks to a child normally thinking, you know, I've got this new look. Kids are going to be teasing me. And dad and mom say, relax, son. Nobody's going to make fun of your new braces because of everybody's wearing masks. So the, the new normal or the, the current normal is such a shock for kids. And for many kids, particularly African-American children, young children who uh, really loved the Black Panther films, and even kids who loved the Marvel Comics films, the death of the Black Panther caused trauma for a lot of kids. And some of us might laugh and think, oh, that's nothing. But you saw little kids doing these little um, uh, action figure memorials when Chadwick Boseman died. You never saw that when other action figures died. So something is clicking in the minds of young people. We don't even need to talk about the televised deaths that have happened, the, the murder of George Floyd, the, the constant reminder of the murders of so many, um, unfortunately, by, uh, in the hands of authority. So for children, this is a difficult thing, and we've got to acknowledge that. So quickly on part one, we're going to talk about what is resilience and we can talk about how is resilience weakened 
and how can resilience be strengthened? And we're gonna share a couple promising practices in youth resilience. So this little clown, I don't know the age group of the people on, but some of, this, some of us grew up with this little bouncy clown where there was lead in the bottom and you would hit the clown and he would go, go sideways and he'd bounce back. And you hit him again and he'd go sideways and he'd bounce back. Sometimes you hit him so hard that he'd go sideways and then he'd bounce forward to where he'd go beyond where he was originally. And that I think is the most simple definition of resilience. And then there's a more psychological one. When faced with a tragedy or crisis, natural or disaster, any kind of concern, resilience is how well a person can adapt to their events in life. So a person with good resilience has the ability to bounce back more quickly and with less stress than someone whose resilience is less developed. But that does require a certain core of elements in order for that resilience to be strong. So here's some interesting in, uh, issue. It, I, I thought this was interesting to share the realms of resilience. This comes from an airman fitness program. So you think about people going into the army and the physical uh, effort and strength they have to have. And my focus is more on the physical and spiritual resilience, whereas Sang Hoon, who will come up next, will focus more on the mental, emotional, and social resilience. But as you can see, these realms of resilience all provide balance to life. We can be physically resilient, but if we don't have that family communications, connections, a mental mindset and core values of purpose and spirituality, then we may not be as resilient as we think. And you can do that with each one. So this is this sort of is a comprehensive look at how we become resilient as people. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Sang Hoon, who's going to specifically speak to what how is resilience weakened through adverse childhood experiences. Sang Hoon. Thank you, Jana. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm I'm so honored and blessed to be here and. Um, I really appreciate um, uh, Youth uh, Ministry uh, Institute in Yale and the host and, and all of you. I, I wish I can see you all uh, in person. Um, well, some of you or many of you know the adverse childhood experiences, which is a research done by Dr. Felody and Anda about 20 years ago. Um, maybe you heard, uh, you never heard about it. I'm going to briefly uh, introduce the, the concept here. So the slide says, uh, what weakens the resilience? Um, adverse childhood experiences, I'm going to call it ACEs. ACEs are a potentially traumatic events that can have a negative and lasting effects on health and well-being. So you see there that um, abuse and neglect and then household dysfunction. So um, Dr. Felody found that there's some patients, he was a medical doctor, and some patients after the treatment, they're gonna come back again and come back again, come back again. So he thought, what is the reason for some patients after the treatment done, they come back? And so he uh, worked with Dr. Anda and other colleagues um, 20 years ago that the two uh, have a research on people that um, what, is, what is the story in the childhood? Because he found those the patients who come back, they had a um, traumatic or toxic stressful um, uh, childhood uh, up to the 18 years old uh, of their life. So they surveyed that. And then uh, with the 10 questionnaires. So there, here we are, the abuse and neglect the household dysfunction. Um, he made uh, 10 questionnaires and then did a survey uh, with about uh, 17,000 people. A very uh, college graduate, just um, you know, middle class, mostly you know, um, uh, Caucasians. And out of the 10 questionnaires, if you check um, uh, three things happen in your life, your AC score is a three. Uh, if you're checking six, then your AC score is a six. And what they found is that there's a humongous coalition that between the what happened in the childhood and especially when there's a, a malfunctioning or toxic stress trauma happen, it impacts the later life health, medical, mental, 
and social functional, all healthy issues. Um, and so uh, there's a humongous coalition. And Dr. Fellow actually visited uh, Phoenix, our ACES consortium, two times um, uh, last a couple of years ago. And he said he has been doing this uh, research for 20 years. And it has been so consistent that the humongous coalition. Um, so uh, maybe we can just say, hey, uh, we, we, we have a lot of childhood and going to have a very uh, rough, you know, adult life. Um, I think it kind of makes sense. But why it is very important? Because our traditional model of a medical uh, treatment or behavior treatment, still we are focusing on what's going on right now, right? If you go to the therapist, what brought you here today, um, you know, medical doctors, so you can talk about your symptoms, what's going on. But what the, this research is kind of a revolutionary kind of eye-opening that, well, if we don't talk about the root cause of the current symptoms, then the symptoms can come back and come back and come back. So the national phrase of this movement, I'm part of this trauma from the care and trauma from the community building movement with the ACES study and then um, uh, the development of the brain science. Um, instead of asking what's wrong with you, uh, we ask what happened to you. Um, I mean, it doesn't mean that the what happened to you gonna resolve the, the, all the issues, but it, this really provides that um, people, our youth, that um, instead of being judged by what they show right now, we have a kind of room and space that, okay, I'm here to listen to your story. And this has a tremendous healing impact on you by simply asking that, which I've been witnessing with so many experiences. Okay, Jenna, sorry, we can go to the next slide. Um, and so this is from original study. Uh, that's kind of a very, um, uh, again, an enlightening and an eye-opening kind of a, um, uh, uh, study that, um, still, um, two thirds of the population um, in uh, United States still have at least one ACEs. Um, it's kind of pretty consistent. And from the original study that the 33% have no ACEs. And we see the in the middle, the orange column that the one to three, and then the blue uh, column, the 16% is four to 10. Um, I'm not gonna go into the depth. Uh, you're gonna have the slides, right, I think. And, but you can just see the humongous, the, the difference, contrast here. If you have zero ACEs, one out of the 16 smokes, one out of the 480 use IV drugs, and uh, one ha uh, either 14 has a heart disease, one out of 96 attempt suicide. But if you have a seven or more ACEs, what happened? Then um, uh, the research shows that one out of six smokes and when zero case, one out of uh, 480, but now one out of 30 use IV drugs, heart disease, one out of 14 to become one out of six. Suicide attempt, one out of 96, but if you have more, several more ACEs, uh, one out of five attempts on suicide. So this is a very kind of alarming and eye-opening, but also sometimes ACEs is kind of uh, criticized like, uh, well, it's all about bad news or we are discriminating people. You know, we are also talking about nowadays the compounding factors of ACEs, which means, yeah, the time dysfunctional or abuse and neglect in the family, but we have to see what is the compounding factors, poverty, crime rate, and historical trauma, uh, especially uh, with the COVID and racism tension currently we are going through. Uh, we need to really go in depth of that uh, uh, root causes, uh, not only personally family, but sociologically and in the history of our community. And uh, of course, um, another factor is environmental. We talk about global warming. Uh, you know how many youth just kind of rose uh, to the movement to global warming. But now the uh, COVID pandemic is around the whole um, uh, world. And so all these things need to be uh, considered because all these things really can decrease the resilience, the, the energy empowerment, and to go uh, fight against the adversity among youth. So um, uh, uh, I just wanna uh, give you this information, but also I'm gonna give you hope. I'm the personally a trauma survivor, and um, I'm so much kind of uh, get benefit out of this movement and knowledge and skill set. And also I've been serving a lot of youth with uh, um, uh, ACEs seven and nine, 10. 
So it's not about the bad news, but it's about the knowledge. Because when you know, Dr. Anda said, what is preventable, I'm sorry, what is predictable is preventable. So we are really working on more preventing this ACEs and also decreasing the impact of ACEs so we can increase the resiliency among youth. So we can go next. Right. Oops. <laughs> are stuck. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So uh, we talked about that. What impact us to weaken our resiliencies? And Jenna talked about the, what happened during the summer pandemic. You know, and I was talking about more root causes, right? Um, now I'm going to talk more about uh, our social, emotional, mental, and uh, Jenna is going to talk about more spiritual uh, resilience. How we're going to increase that among youth and youth workers. Well, I'm just showing you the, the, the brain picture, right? So this is uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Perry's um, very famous model, a neurosequential model. And, and actually he talked about the three R. It says regulate, relate, and reason. So in our current normal setting, we go from the top to bottom, right? Logical dialogue, there's a rule and you, you keep it and you're gonna be loved and accepted here in our community or school or church or our faith community, and you're gonna be safe here. But what happened when the, the, the safety it was threatened, uh, not because of my willful choice, but because of a trigger of uh, previous trauma or something happened, or I'm just being judged because of how I'm looking at. Um, so uh, when there is a re-traumatization or the danger or safety threatened, um, what we need to do based on the brain science is that we need to go to the bottom-up approach, uh, which means regulate, relate, reason. By regulating um, our um, brain stem, then we um, make sure that person is, um, let's say just youth, or so just Dante. <laughs> uh, Dante gonna be the, uh, is going to be feel safe physically, emotionally, and spiritually, mentally. So um, that even we just ask what happened to you. You know, we, we, uh, we, we are fine here. We, we are fine here. And also there's another phrase, what is right with you? How can I help you, right? Uh, instead of, hey, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Behave, this is a classroom. You cannot do that, right? Instead of doing that, that we um, really uh, mentally, emotionally, uh, and also physically make a, a safety is guaranteed. And then next step is for the limbic system brain that we provide our expression of our love. So the, the youth are not gonna be uh, feel rejected, abandoned, discriminated, judged, even bullied. So this is very, very important when uh, the brain science tells us when we, are, uh, we feel safe, we are safe and we feel love it, then we are ready to do our logical dialogue, you know? And so when I'm beloved and when I'm regulated and I feel like, oh, now I can talk with you. So do you remember that um, what happened? And can you talk about this? This is very, very important. I'm still seeing that a lot of youth go to the principal room or, or you know, in my school system or the church pastors, just we are only focused on the story. You know, even, even, even we ask what happened to you, it's not about focusing the story. We need to provide their safe and accepted love you first. Um, next one, Jenna. So um, with that, um, I wanna emphasize that um, in order to increase that the resiliency, also you and I are major impact on this youth resilience. Why? Because um, I learned that brain is not just a biological organ. Brain is a sociological cultural organ and brain is very, very uh, sensitive to the relationship. And when our relationship affects our brain, it impacts all our physical, mental, social development. So Dr. Perry was, Bruce Perry was in Oprah show kind of year, uh, two years ago, one year ago. And Oprah asked doc, Dr. Perry, so what is the most important thing to um, recover from the trauma? And he said, one, one word, relationship. Isn't it interesting? 
Um, and so in our movement, we really want to try to uh, help that the youth workers and also youth together. Because it's not about us and them model, like a medical model. I'm here, I'm going to fix you, help you, help you, or, you know, uh, the cure you. But we are all in this together. So I want to suggest this uh, resilience and self-care as we are all in this together, doing together. What do we need to do? Uh, well, healthy, safe, constant relationship. That's the most important thing. Um, maybe it's kind of ambiguous. What does it mean? Um, but um, maybe I wish I had more time, but uh, we're going to just go from here that we make sure that healthy, trustworthy, and constant relationship. And of course, sleep. You know, we know how many hours we need to sleep a day. And exercise and nutrition and mindfulness and spiritual interventions and mental health interventions. I think this is very, very important. We know mental health intervention is important, but still the reality is that in our shaming culture, you know, I ask them, my youth, you know, why don't you go to counseling? Suddenly they say, I'm not crazy, you know? So, uh, and then one of, one of them went to the counseling room and then, and, and then and I asked, so what, what are you going on with the counselors? And, and, and the guys told me that, huh, that was interesting. Whatever you say, yeah, they say too. Uh, to me, that's not redundancy. It's really affirming. You know, that's kind of a great model that how we can work together. Um, but we need to really um, uh, improve our kind of atmosphere of shaming, giving more guilt, more judgment. Again, safe environment is very, very important. So um, I'm not saying just this, you need to do this. But I'm just presenting this. Hey, let's build a role model out of this. So we are all doing together. According to research, the, what is the most uh, effective uh, trauma therapy, uh, trauma recovery method, or building resilience to the youth group? By role modeling. It's not pill. It's not therapy sessions. Role modeling. They need you and me to see how, how can I kill myself? And how can I build the resiliency? So I just want to now present this to you. And maybe Jana, your turn. Well, thank you, Sang Hoon. And we are going to go quickly through this section because we want to be sure to get into the breakout rooms by about 1245. So we want to be sure that we have time to share a little bit about spiritual resilience and some of the practices that many of you are probably very familiar with, but really the research has shown that these practices can really help build resilience with young people and of course with adults. And then we're gonna share two of the promising practices where Sang Hoon and I had incorporated some of these uh, practices into the efforts that we worked on with young people. And then we're gonna move right into the breakout sessions. So the first and foremost, even though all of us or many of us may have a specific religion that we aspire to, spiritual resilience is not so much about religion but it's about meaning, it's about purpose, it's about grounding. And so through each life experience, we engage in soul seeking. And so remember, we talked about those elements that have uh, captured the COVID environment for young people as soul provoking. And so the spiritual resilience allows us to come out of that soul provoking into a soul seeking for identity, for connection, for purpose, for meaning. And this is so important when a young person has been so confused by so many things that they get an opportunity to be regrounded. And unfortunately for some of our young people, that regrounding is not available for them in the home where now the virus is keeping us all in or where civil unrest is keeping us all in. So think about that as you work with the young people, even over the internet, you know, meditation, prayer, you know, practicing simplicity, even teaching the young people how to journal and write down their thoughts. And there may be some artistic expression of journaling. I have a, one of my grandsons is a, a journalist through art, uh, really giving them an opportunity to confess, like Sang Hoon said, when they've gone through an experience, either to confess the good, confess the bad, be that safe place for them for confession. Teaching them and modeling gratitude 
teaching and modeling solitude and silence. So much of what we do is so much activity all the time, always on our phones, always on the web, always doing stuff. But where's the power now in solitude and silence? There's a lot of power in that. And then celebration, reflection, music, and movement. So many of these kids, if you think about it, have been sitting for months in a chair at a computer screen. So maybe the bit longest walk has been from the computer screen to the refrigerator, to their room. And so that idea of encouraging movement and dance and what have you, these are spiritual practices that can increase resilience. So we want you all to think about these as we go into uh, the breakout in a minute, because we want you to keep that framework in mind, not just the uh, physical, the, the emotional, the mental, but also the spiritual framework that you would uh, apply in a particular situation that you'll see in a moment. So there are two promising practices that we want to share. Uh, I'll share the first one, which is one that I worked on in my time at Homeland Security. Uh, we had been uh, deployed to the city of Los Angeles for numerous issues, whether it was police uh, shootings, whether it was the potential for an earthquake, uh, whether it was issues related to uh, H1N1. And I was deployed there to work with a lot of these, uh, what do you call first responder communities on how do we engage the community with first response so it's not an us and them, as Sang Hoon said. And we did this a lot with Katrina, which gives people uh, a power to sense that they can walk out of the crisis in partnership as opposed to be pulling out, being pulled out as a victim, they come out as a survivor. And so one of the things we decided to do was to um, engage with the Watts Gang Task Force. Uh, for those of you who may not be from Los Angeles, the area of Watts is in South LA, and it's an area that has been known for a lot of civil unrest, uh, violence, uh, quite a few good things too. You've got a lot of resilient people in Watts. Uh, but there are some issues that young people see uh, on a regular basis that are, are very troubling. And one of them is the issue of people getting hurt from either gang violence, drive-by shootings, uh, things like that. As a matter of fact, one night when we were doing our training uh, outside of the public health department, uh, my supervisor was actually coming to the training and he got stuck because there was a, uh, a driving, two cars driving, shooting at each other, and people had, you know, kind of stopped to let these cars go by. And these are the types of things. I mean, they've even had uh, flooding in Watts when other parts of the city were not flooded. But what we found was that the fire department had not done any kind of safety training in that area. And so we went in as a group of us uh, uh, in partnership with people in the community and we decided to do a training with youth with this 40-year-old program that had not reached African-American or Latino youth in Watts to build tactical resilience in the areas of gang violence and in the areas of risk of, of crisis. So you can see some of the pictures here where young people participated in a 10-week training session. It included aspects of emotional resilience because some of them, as they began to recount the issues that they had seen in their community. Fortunately, we had social workers and public health nurses who were part of our team. And then there was a public health assessment. But there was a lot of physical resilience being built up, giving them a chance to, to tactically see how they could stop the bleeding, how they could put out fires, how they could keep people from choking, how they could do things that would help their community. We even had one, that top picture is at an aeronautical institute in Compton, where young people were being taught to fly so that they could be the aerial eyes in the time of, the, of an earthquake if a really bad one hit. But upon graduation, and this happened in several cohorts, I was there for four cohorts. They're now up to about 10 cohorts. And upon graduation, many of the youth expressed a new sense of purpose and commitment to community. So there's that spiritual aspect of resilience as well. So we wanted to share that one. And here's some of the other pictures where you see the young people bandaging up people. Uh, the one at the bottom right, they're uh, dealing with a gunshot wound. Um, and so this is the kind of physical, tactical resilience where you can build in the emotional com 
component. You can build in the physical component with the right type of multidisciplinary team. And our team included fire, fire people, police officers, nurses, social workers, uh, people who had been in the gangs, uh, members of the gang task force. And it, uh, this happened in Watts, in Compton, in Lawndale, uh, and they're still going on now. So we wanted to share that example. And Sang Hoon has one from a behavioral perspective that's really good as well. Sang Hoon? Thank you, Jana. Um, I, now I suddenly remember, you know, that we worked together for the CERT and emergency preparedness, you know, and city of Tempe mayor called out the faith leaders. So I was director to um, the train on the churches and mosques and working with the fire and police and to the, uh, the trainings. And we, you, we had the, uh, the youth group a lot. And you know what? Nowadays, they are really great with the IT and computers. And, you know, I just uh, allow them to develop their own program, interactive map, you know, out of all this training, you know, how we're going to engage the community. So I think it's good to really um, uh, encourage them to be part of this and also um, the, uh, use their gift. They're amazing. Um, uh, my life. Well, um, this is, um, I got involved um, in the uh, city of Tempe uh, that, uh, my life is uh, Magellan. Magellan is a national uh, organization and for mental health. And, and they created, um, uh, it's called My Life, about 10 years ago in Arizona, which was the first model. Um, My Life stands here, Magellan Youth Leaders Inspiring Future Empowerment. So um, there are the youth with the mental illness and aging of foster care and um, also youth with the homeless. There are a lot of people that are suffering and then they are depending on Magellan's services. So besides that, they started a community group uh, uh, as a youth group. Um, and I worked with the uh, director closely. And so the Facebook City, which is my ministry, and we joined it together. Um, actually, the picture is that kind of, uh, is um, a picture of the Hope Rising Conference that happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, it has about 160 sessions uh, with the whole around the world coming together for suicide prevention. So um, Haley was that uh, youth leader uh, when my life was birthed. And so she's talking about our collaboration, how the my life, Magellan My Life and then our uh, ministry of Facebook City work together. Um, Jenna, can you share the next two slides? Um, so I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be long uh, here, but I'm just gonna show you the pictures here. That so we just basically gather together, and um, um, we just uh, give them safe environment, and they should they just develop their own project. They do whatever they want um, uh, weekly. Um, so we've been doing that about four years, a certain period of time in the past. And out of this, um, actually, the, uh, you can see the, the bridge in you know, a kind of small mountain. That's a Tempe area uh, where the Arizona State University uh, Tempe campus is located. Um, and so um, with that kind of a, uh, environment, we built a lot of trust together. Um, my ministry um, uh, students um, and also Magellan youth. Uh, we built the, uh, our rapport and collaboration together. And then uh, suddenly director decided, hey, let's do the MyFest, which is going to be the um, uh, youth mental health awareness program for the whole statewide. So the unique thing is that we work with them to empower the leadership of my life group, not depending on any kind of other, but by the le creating leadership. And, and also we have uh, my ministry, um, uh, uh, leaders from the uh, Arizona State University. So they're kind of mentor. So we're kind of mentoring, empowering these young youth leaders to run this statewide event. Uh, each year we had about 10,000 people coming and with about 100 organizations working together. So this was a very unique um, experiences and we are surprised how much they can do. So you can see them kind of dancing, you know, that's a kind of flash mob and during our event. So uh, we, the, the Mazolan youth, our ministry youth and working together and to, to organize and participate. And, and the picture uh, actually above that is the kind of looking like a park and park cleaning, right? So uh, we empower them and then we give them another step, which is, uh, hey, you can be a leader as a servant leader not just a leader on the stage. 
So uh, we were the group that uh, uh, adopted the park in the city of Tempe for the first time in the city history. And so we started park cleaning. You know, it's, it's interesting when, you said, when we said, hey, do you want to come to the park cleaning? And our youth from Magellan said, no. Uh, it took about three years. I don't know. Three years is kind of my time frame, you know, for change of the people's life. And three years, they just come. They come because we kind of a barbecue after cleaning. They want to eat hamburger. But after three years, slowly, oh, you know what? I want to help you. And slowly they get engaged. So we really kind of uh, um, uh, bring them, empowering them, and becoming a leaders in the stage, leading the statewide event. But also, you can be a servant leader, truly serving the community, humbly. And then, um, oh, I don't want to do the cleaning, but we saw that by role modeling, they are changing. So that was kind of been a, a unique uh, experience, how we can uh, work together to help out the youth and then becoming the all uh, community together. And now my life is about um, uh, six, seven cities in the United States uh, uh, be because it's a national organization, start from Arizona, and kind of a very uh, exemplary uh, youth movement. Thank you. Thank you, sang -Hoon. So now as we get ready to go into, I don't know why this is stuck, the mindfulness exercise, which will prepare us for the breakout. Let me stop share and try again because this is stuck for some reason. Um, we want you to really think about this framework of young people having been dealing with things like seeing a murder where someone's life was snuffed out on international TV, thinking about young people seeing people being asphyxiated by a virus where their life is snuffed out within less than a matter of a week, young people seeing things where they're not able to get out and just breathe because of the lockdown, young people seeing situations in their families being totally turned upside down. And all they want to do is just breathe. So before we go into the breakout sessions, which will be in the breakout maybe 15, 20 minutes just because of time, uh, Sang Hoon would like to share with us some quick mindfulness exercises. And Sang Hoon, if maybe we can um, limit the time a little bit on the mindfulness just to get us into breakout and we can both continue the conversation on the mindfulness as we're in the breakout. But think about it in this context as we are being led by Sang Hoon in this mindfulness exercise. Okay, um, the reason we do the, the mindfulness is that actually as Janet said, the title is just to breathe. And so I hope that we can have some time to just um, more regulated and, and calm. Um, with this pandemic era, um, I lead this exercise a lot um, um, while I'm doing the training and, and you know, trauma from the care. Um, because the national conversation uh, with this pandemic is that more slow down. And then everybody's anxious, everybody's dysregulated. So, um, let's um, uh, think about actually what I can control, what I cannot control. You got a lot of information from us, Jenna and me. I mean, you may have a kind of a, you know, brain spinning right now, but also at the same time, oh my gosh, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. A lot of times what I cannot control really gives us more worries, isn't it? Um, what I can control is what I can do right now at the present moment about me, to me, and also somebody in front of me. Although there are so many concerns um, uh, in, in this um, suffering world with the pandemic and racial tensions, everything going on. So I just give you, I'm gonna give you 20, 30 seconds to think about what I can control, what I can control. And then we're gonna just do the breathing uh, three times. Um, that's what I'm gonna do, okay? So you can just uh, uh, 
uh, sit very comfortably um, or if you want to move around uh, that's totally fine and you don't have to follow me but um, uh, just feel comfortable you can close your eyes you don't have to or you can jot down what I can control what I can So, as you think about what I can control, also try to sense what you feel, what you think. Is there any tension in your muscle? You feel something on your body? And you can just to touch that area, even just to massage it a little bit. Just try to relax with a gentle breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Also, we can think about what I can control. And let's try to release all our stress, concerns and worries and anxiety or anxiousness as we gently breathe in, breathe out. Again, one more time, just to breathe in, breathe out. With that, we're gonna have a 20 seconds of our centering, which means just a pop of one good word, we'll focus, and we're gonna just focus on that word. If we don't want to, or there are so many thoughts going around, that's fine. Just we just try to be quietly, focus on our soul and mind and body toward the one word. We can pick up the word like hope, compassion, grace, unconditional love. Let's start. Okay, two more times of deep breathing. Gently breathe in, breathe out. One last time. Breathe in, breathe out. Thank you. Thank you, Sang Hoon. I really hope that people got a sense of where we were trying to go with that. We really want you to be in a space now where you can hear about Dante. A young man not so uncommon in many of our communities across the country. And as you, as youth workers, come upon and engage Dante, we want you to think about Dante from a framework of resilience and think about how you can model resilience for him through what thoughts and ideas you develop in the little bit of time we have left today. We're going to ask Megan now to take us into the breakouts where you will see the composite youth profile of Dante. You will see three major questions, but we've broken them out into six. We may just go with the three major ones. We'll have to see how each group goes. And then we'll spend a little time in you developing a model. And we want some of you to be ready to come back and share out 
from a framework of resilience, how you are going to engage the Dantes of the world in the future. So Megan, we'll turn it to you for breakout session. I think everyone has found our way back to the space. Jenna, you're muted. There you go. All right. Now that everybody is back, and we've just got a few minutes, I know we, we went a little bit over time, but we were so excited to be able to do this work. So we're just gonna go through a couple of report outs here. Uh, we understood the things that we could and couldn't change. And uh, we examined those things that we could control and tried to identify them. And then in the breakout groups, we suggested some interventions as ways to increase resilience. So now we're going to do some share outs. And I'd like to actually uh, start uh, with my group, and then we'll go quickly to uh, Sang Hoon's group. Just take maybe uh, three minutes at the most. And I might call on a couple people, if you don't mind, unless there's someone who really feels comfortable with sharing out. And the first person I'd like to call on, and if you don't want to do it, just, just turn on your mic and say, uh, next. I'd like to uh, call on Jonathan. Is he still uh, here? Yeah, still here. Um, the, uh, the thing that I noticed uh, off the bat with Dante is that there wasn't a father figure in the home. Uh, and he, he was the oldest child. So the, the kind of the men relationship dynamic is a bit, a bit odd. Uh, the uncle's just out of prison, so we don't know his, uh, his background. The, the boyfriend's always fighting with the mom. His grandfather passed away. So he's probably looking for some sh sort of example or role model or somebody that he can um, get guidance from and, and try to figure out life from. So that was the first thing that I noticed uh, about Thank Don. you. Thank you. And then I want to go to uh, Gina and ask her to share about some of the ways of intervening to help strengthen resilience for Dante and his family, and maybe even in the midst, strengthening your resilience as a youth pastor. Um, so my, uh, I serve a church in rural New Hampshire, and we have developed really strong relationships with the social workers and guidance counselors in our school district. And so we've partnered with them um, to, to also help us during this moment. So trying to use their connections to vulnerable families to help us identify who doesn't have internet. How can we um, help provide hotspots through connections like TechSoup. Um, how do we sort of put together some care packages that we literally drive around um, and drop off in people's driveways so we can actually see a family and kind of put eyeballs on the case um, and drop off bags of food and snacks um, and silly games and just some resources for folks. So in this breakout group, one of the biggest themes was understanding the unseen like fatherlessness, un unspoken expectations, the limits of online learning, falling behind, all the things that could discourage or make Dante's life that much more difficult. And then bringing that together in a multidisciplinary approach as a youth minister in the lead to really minister to that family. So Sang Hoon, we're gonna ask you to, to have your group report out just two minutes, and then we'll see if there's time for one or two questions before we end. All right, thank you, Jenna. We formed an amazing team helping Dante Mission, and um, we um, got a, a director, Andrew. Um, um, he was amazing, and then we had a lot of great opinions, and he got a report out. Andrew? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so kind of the first thing we noticed was we were looking at that question, what can Dante control? What can't he control? What can you control? What can't he control? And oh boy, there's a lot that no one can control in that situation. Um, and as someone remarked in a group that our, our instinct may be to jump and try to fix it, um, which like is my instinct too, but that's not uh, your job and that's not your place. And instead we talked a lot about um, what we can control is being someone that is a, a constant, um, presence in Dante's life, in a sense, being someone that Dante can control, not in like a manipulative sense, but like someone he can rely on, right? Um, whether that's providing emotional support or in the cases of, you know, depending on your communities, like COVID numbers and safety regulations, like practicing radical hospitality and saying like, Dante, you need to come over and do your homework for a couple of minutes. You know, 
uh, said one detail that I noticed was that Dante lives as a family of uh, 10 uh, in a house built for six. So there's probably a, he has very little uh, space for downtime, right? Um, and my poor introverted heart just felt for this hypothetical kid. Um, and so, you know, maybe meeting those needs in small ways, like Dante need to come, want to come over with some, some guys from the youth group and just play some video games for a couple hours or something, you know, um, whatever you can do to, to bring Christ to him and to bring that peace and resilience to him uh, would be f beneficial. And at the same time, trying to, um, you know, partner with the community and he doesn't have internet. So can you advocate on his behalf to the school system and say, hey, this kid needs, you know, a laptop. Is there anything we can do? Um, and you know, connect him and his family to other resources that can help in a more appropriate manner while providing that emotional support. Thank you so much, Andrew. One of the things I want to ask before we go into a quick Q&A is if you have a Dante in your community, would you just either raise your hand if there's a raise your hand function or, or note it in the chat so that we get a sense of who really is dealing with these uh, issues with young people now. And the second question, uh, thank you for that. I see a few hands up. Uh, the second question then is, um, did you find anything that was new to you in terms of building resilience with young people like Dante? And if you did, just put a hand up. We'd just like to know that. I see a couple hands. Not many hands on the did you find anything new. Um, so that means that a lot of people are understanding to examine the unseen when you're looking at these young people. You're understanding the need to have a multidisciplinary approach in your ministry. You're understanding the fact that there are some things that you cannot control, but those things you can control, you offer it to the young people uh, freely that and there are some things that you're doing already, whether it's dance, music, spiritual, other spiritual practices that are helping the young people. So that's great to hear. And uh, then we want to open it up to you all to see if there are any questions. I think we have maybe a minute for questions, if there's a quick question or two, and then we'll turn it back to Jill for the closing. I'd like to, to throw out a question that a member of this community asked in the chat. Uh, I know we don't have very much time um, and we probably won't be able to do justice to this answer, but it's a good question. So, you know, this person is wondering about the current movement of racial reckoning that we're seeing in this country, especially for our black and brown youth and what the relationship might be between political resistance and spiritual resilience. The relationship between political resistance and spiritual resilience. That is such an interesting question. I don't know that I have a good answer for that, but I look back at the times of the civil rights movement of the 60s, and I know that the spiritual resilience of people like Dr. King, uh, Bayard Rustin, uh, uh, John Lewis, uh, and many of the others uh, was what kept them going. It kept them in the resistance. It kept them in the idea of moving forward in a nonviolent way, even at the uh, expense of their life. And so I would say from my perspective, even though I don't have a good research-based answer for that, I think that spiritual resistance uh, is, is one way that people thrive in political uh, spiritual resilience is one way that people thrive in political resistance because without it, you're not really grounded. And when I say spiritual, again, like we said earlier, spirit doesn't necessarily mean religion, but it means a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, a sense that, you know, there's something that I'm on this planet for that is more important than what is on me. And I think that's where um, spiritual resil resilience really helps in having to deal with political resistance. Sang Hoon, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, one quick thing is that the um, identity of Dante is Dante as a beloved child of God. And we need to empower Dante with it. Dante has a poverty. Poverty is not his identity. 
um, mental health is not the, his identity. What he doesn't have is not his identity. So it's very important in resiliency that identity with a cultural heritage, that's a, one of the protective factor in the resiliency, especially among black uh, and brown kids that uh, we have today. Thank you. Unfortunately, yeah, folks, we are at time, um, but I want to thank Dr. Scott and Pastor Yu for their time today. It's been a rich presentation, and thank you all for your participation. We hope to see you all uh, next month on November 4th at 1 p.m. for our next offering. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.